Okay, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Look down at your Bibles at verse number 10. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and trust also are made manifest in your consciences. And the title of the sermon this morning is The Judgment Seat of Christ. I want to preach on the judgment seat of Christ. Now, turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 14. Hold your place there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. We're going to look at a couple verses real quick in Romans chapter 14. The judgment seat of Christ deals with primarily the saved believers who are going to receive a reward uh, when all this is over, basically. And I'm going to explain to you when this actually takes place. But there is a judgment seat. There is a judgment for Christians. Now, the misconception is that, that this judgment is for, you know, the sins that we've done, you know. People think, well, the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is going to judge us for every sin, sin that we've committed and the stuff that we've done bad on this side of, this side of eternity. God's going to judge us for it. But nothing can be further from the truth. Right. You know, the judgment seat of Christ is not to judge us for the sins that we've committed in this lifetime as Christians, but rather it's a judgment of what type of rewards we're going to receive. Now look at the Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 9, it says, For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. God. So the Bible's telling us here that there will be a time where we give an account to God for the things done in our body, whether they be good and whether they be bad. And people want to use that to say, well, yeah, it says bad, you know, all the bad stuff that we've done. No, it's referring to the quality of work that we've, that we've done in this world. So he's going to judge our work, the things that we've done, the labors that we've been involved in, and he's going to judge it to see if it's a good quality work or if it's bad quality work. He said, what happens if it's good quality? We receive a reward. What happens if it's a bad quality work? Then we don't receive anything. In fact, the Bible tells us that these things shall be burned. Probably the only thing that we shall suffer is shame. Okay? So contrary to popular belief, the judgment seat of Christ is not to judge us for our sins. You know, there's a lot of groups out there that will say, you know, oh, you got to make sure that you're enduring to the end so that you can be saved. You know, they teach a works-based salvation, and they'll use that scripture to teach that we need to stay in church, stay in our Bibles, not sin, so that we can be saved, you know, spiritually speaking, in the end times or when we die. But that's not what the Bible's teaching us at all, okay? And in fact, the Bible's teaching us, the Bible teaches us that when we get saved, Christ's righteousness is imputed unto us. What does that mean? His perfection is given to us. Now, that doesn't mean that we're perfect, we're sinless. What that means is that when God looks at us when we're saved, He looks at us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, if that were, not, if that were the case, if the case was that God is judging us for our sins at the judgment seat of Christ, then that doctrine goes out the window. Because at that point, we don't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ to be imputed upon us so that when God looks at us, you know, He sees the blood of Christ. No, instead, what we see here is that God is going to judge us, Jesus Christ is going to judge us, in order to determine what type of rewards we're going to receive, okay? Now, let me just say this, is that there are many reasons why we serve Christ. Many reasons. And in my opinion, there are three major motives as to why we serve the Lord, okay? Now, number one, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you would. Number one, the chiefest reason as to why we serve Christ is because we love Him, okay? We love Him. You know, the Bible tells us in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So the Bible's telling us here that it's the love of Christ that motivates us to serve Him, Right? And motivates us to stay in church, to love our families, to be able to go soul win, to disciple people. It's God's love that is shed abroad in our hearts that motivates us to do these things, right? This should be the prime motive as to why we serve the Lord. And look, this is the reason why we need to stay in our Bibles. This is the reason why we need to continue to pray. We need to continue to have close fellowship with the Lord in order to keep and cultivate that love for God, okay? So that's one of the reasons. And that's the prime reason. But the second reason would be out of fear of the consequences if we don't. 
You know, God is greatly to be feared. He's a terrible God. The Bible tells us he is a terrible God. And you know what? The fact is, is that the Bible teaches us that there's consequences to our actions. And you know what that does? That causes us to stay right with God because we don't want to suffer the ramifications of disobedience to God's commands. You know, when we see the Bible and how God smites the fornicators and he pronounces judgment on people who are involved in wicked sin, it causes us to fear and say, I don't want to be judged. I don't want God to, to chastise me. I don't want to die. I don't want God to just judge me and for his wrath to fall upon me in this world. Therefore, I'm going to make sure that I live a clean life. I want to make sure that I live a life that's ob in obedience to Christ because I don't want to suffer those ramifications. And look, that's a good thing. Amen. To fear the Lord is a good thing. And in fact, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is to, it, when, when men fear the Lord, they depart from evil. Okay. You know, when we fear God, we try to stay away from that which is evil and wicked because we know that there are, there, there are consequences that come with that. But the third reason, this, this is the reason we're going to talk about this morning, is that we serve the Lord because he offers us a reward. And in fact, he offers us rewards. Okay. And it says there in verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter 10. This is a great reason to serve the Lord. Amen? And the reason for that is because, you know, people sometimes think, well, the Christian life is so boring. It's just all about obedience and just, you know, obeying God's commands and there's no fun. And it's just God up in heaven telling us, pointing the finger at us, telling us to do this, do that. If not, I'm going to punish you. Not necessarily, you know, because the person who is just used to serving the Lord and being in church and doing all these things, they're not always fearing that something bad's going to happen to them, right? Because the Bible tells us that the wicked flee when no man pursueth but the righteous are bold as a lion. So you know what? If you're in church, if you're doing that which is right, you, didn't, you shouldn't necessarily always be afraid that something bad's going to happen to you. And in fact, the greatest, one of the greatest incentives to serve the Lord is knowing that God will recompense us for the labor that we do. Amen. You know, the Bible tells us that in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. He's, he's providing that incentive to say, hey, don't quit on the Lord. Don't quit on church. Don't quit on winning people to Christ. Don't quit on discipling people. Why? Because God is going to reward you for the labor that you do, but you just got to make sure that you don't faint. You got to make sure that you endure the afflictions and the hardships and even the mundane of serving the Lord because it can be mundane sometimes, okay? Now, you're in Mark chapter 10. I'm going to read to you from Revelation 22, 12. It says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. The Bible tells us, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Look, I believe God's telling us the truth there. I believe that he is telling us that every good thing that we can receive, he will not withhold from us if we just seek to walk uprightly, if we seek to serve the Lord. The Bible tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Over and over again in the Bible, you see God telling us, hey, I'm going to reward you. I'm going to reward you. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you that. But you've got to make sure you have faith. You've got to make sure you adore. You've got to make sure you labor. Okay? Look, in the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow to it. We know that when God rewards, he rewards heavily. And he often rewards us far more than what we really deserve, right? So one thing that we can see over and over again is that God is giving us an incentive to labor for him. Let me read to you from Matthew chapter 16. You're in Mark chapter 10. It says in Matthew 16, verse 21, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, what is the implication there? Well, if he's saying you have to deny yourself and take up your cross, what he's saying is this, you have to die to self. Just as Jesus took up the cross and was willing to die, the, the Bible tells us that we are to be a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. It goes on to say, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. You know, if you live in this world only worried about how, what you can get out of it and the money that you can make and the fame that you want and possessions that you can accumulate, the Bible tells us you're going to lose your life. But if you're willing to lose your life for Jesus' sake, to deny yourself, to take up your cross, then you're going to find your life. Okay? It goes on to say, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world 
and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now, this can be interpreted both ways, because when Christ comes, we are rewarded. Now, the judgment seat of Christ does not happen when he comes at the rapture. It actually happens after that. But how are we rewarded? By the glorified body that we receive. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. But let me say this. He does reward other people as well. Because reward basically means he's going to give you what you deserve. And you know what? The day of the Lord, which is also the rapture, is not only the redemptions of our bodies. It's God's wrath being poured on this world. It's when God rewards the unsaved for their works. Okay? So the great thing about the rewards that God gives is that there's future rewards but there's also immediate rewards because wouldn't it be difficult to just serve the Lord, but not get anything for it this side of eternity? You know, you just have to think, well, one day, you know, in a thousand years or something or whenever this takes place, you know, uh, I'm going to receive that reward. The great thing about serving God is that you see immediate results sometimes. OK, you know, there are immediate rewards that we receive in this lifetime. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 29. And why does he do that? Well, he does that to keep you motivated. Right. He does that to reward us in order to keep us motivated to say, you know what? It's worth serving God. It's worth being in church. It's worth going soul winning because he is rewarding me even even now. Look at verse 29 says, and Jesus answered and said, verily, I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands. By the way, notice it doesn't say wives. <laughs> okay. Some people were like, yeah, you know, polygamy, amen. No. And children and lands. But look what it says. With persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. So what is he saying? Look, if you forsake all these things, if you're willing to serve the Lord, and forsake that which needs to be forsaken, God says, I'm going to reward you in this lifetime. Now, this is not, people will try to use this to try to teach a prosperity gospel, right? You know, serve God, and he's going to make you rich and healthy, and everything's going to be a bed of roses. No, because it says there, with persecutions. <laughs> the prosperity gospel is absent of the element of persecution. They tell you, well, if you live for God, no persecution is going to happen to you. No, the Bible tells us, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yeah. You say, well, I don't suffer any persecution. Well, what does that tell you then? <laughs> According to that verse. Okay. You know, what it's telling us here is that God will provide for our needs, sometimes in miraculous ways. Right. God's going to manifest his power in your life, provide for your needs. And look, sometimes God not only gives us what we need, sometimes he even gives us what we want. Amen. Now, not all the time, because at that point, we, you know, we'll just be like spoiled little brats. But he does give us what we want sometimes. You know, we pray and ask for things and God provides them for us. And that causes us to increase our faith and to realize I should not faint. I want to endure. I want to keep serving God, because if he's willing to reward me immediately, how much more when I just ride this thing out and I stay in it for the long haul? Mm -hmm. You know, I stay in the marathon. I run my race with patience, knowing that I'm going to receive also another reward once I get to heaven, once I meet the Lord face to face. Go to Colossians chapter number three. Colossians chapter three. So he tells us there, we shall receive a hundredfold in this time. He said, how does, I don't understand that. How does that make sense? Well, it tells us houses and brethren and sisters. Let me say this. Once I got saved, I inherited a bunch of brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. And sometimes brothers and sisters in Christ are often actually closer. We actually have a greater affinity, a greater, you know, closeness than even our physical families. Okay. Now it's even better when your families get saved. Amen. When you have your family in church, when you have your sister, your mom and dad, your brother, you know, your cousins, your aunts, you know, whoever it may be, that's a huge blessing. That's like cherry. That's the cherry on top. OK, but let's say you don't have that. You say, well, I'm the only one saved in my family. Well, you know, what? you got yourself a big family here. You know, you have people who love you, who care for you, who will be here for you and so on and so forth. So that and look, that's what's most important. You understand? Possessions are not important. Possessions are going to burn up. You know, they, they're not going to remain forever. What's important is the souls of people. What's important is the church. What's important is what we do for the Lord. Look at Colossians 3, verse 23. 
It says here, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So he's saying there, look, whatever you do, when you're serving God, when you're throwing out the trash, when you're fixing the chairs, when you're doing even the most minuscule things, when you give a cup of water to a child in the name of a disciple, in the name of, of Christ, you know what? Do it heartily as unto the Lord. Because you will receive a reward even for that, the Bible tells us. And it says in verse 25, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. You say, well, how does that tie in? I thought we're not going to be judged for our sins. Well, here's the thing. At, for a Christian, we will be judged for our sins here on this earth. So we will receive the reward and the recompense of our sins on this wor in this world. It's called chastisement. It's called the consequences. We just won't receive it in hell. Amen? Amen? But the Bible tells us, according to Hebrews chapter number 12, that God does chastise and scourge every son whom he receiveth, whom he loveth. So if you are a Christian, you're involved in sin and things that are just destructive, things that are just going to destroy your life, God's going to allow you to be punished. Why? Because he doesn't want his children to live in sin. He doesn't want his children to live in a destructive life that will cause them to get away from the Lord. So sometimes he just allows trials and tribulations and things to come upon them to try to get them to repent. Amen. You say, well, how far is he willing to go? You know, I don't know, but I've seen in the Bible where he just kills people. You say, will that be me? I don't want to find out. <laughs> I'd rather not find out. Oh, that's not right. How can God kill people? You can think it's not right or it's right. It doesn't matter. He's going to do it anyways. <laughs> Because he doesn't ask permission from anybody. You know, the judgments of the Lord are right. And if he sees fit to take someone's life, and look, a saved person, if their life is taken away, what's, what, what happens to them? They go to heaven. He says, so how is that a punishment? Well, it could be a punishment in the sense of you go home early, and now you don't have this time, this side of eternity, to rack up rewards. You know, you live with regret, in a sense, okay? That you were not able to win more people to Christ. You were not able to see your family saved. You are not able to do great exploits for the Lord. Okay? You know, the night cometh when no man can work, the Bible says. Now, go with me, if you would, to go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. So we shall receive a reward, even this side of eternity, but we also will receive a reward for the wrong that we do, the wrong that we do this side of eternity as well. Now, if you're saved, you know, the Bible tells us that you've been forgiven of all sin. Amen? The Bible tells us that he has separated our transgressions as far as east is from west. He's cast our sins in the deepest part of the ocean. They're no longer remembered. They're washed away. And here's the thing. People want to use like 2 Corinthians 5 to say, oh, yeah, you're going to receive, you know, that which is done in your body, whether it be good or bad. God's going to put like a panoramic screen, you know, in heaven and just like show off to everyone all, all the sins you've done. Remember when you did this? Like, you're not getting reward now. It's like, oh, you're just kind of looking around like, oh, man, this is embarrassing, you know. Oh, you thought no one saw you when you did that, huh? Like, well, you're just scrolling through, like, the film of, like, your life, going through each one. That's nonsense. God's not going to do that, okay? Now, if you're not saved, if you're not saved, if you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that you will experience what's called the white throne judgment. And at that point, yeah, there's kind of like a panoramic scream of the sins that you've done. You're going to be judged according to your sins. The Bible says that the book was open and the books were open, referring to the Bible itself, the 66 books, and you're going to be judged out of the things written in the book. Now, that throne, that white throne judgment, is not to judge whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. Because here's the thing. Everyone who's being judged at the white throne has already been in hell. Okay? They've already been in hell from the beginning of time. Whoever was not saved then up until, you know, the end of the millennial reign. So they'll be in hell during that time, and then they actually get taken out of hell to be judged at the white throne judgment and to be relocated to what's called the lake of fire. So that judgment is basically to confirm the condemnation of those who are already damned. Kind of stinks, but, I mean, that's, the, that's why it's important that you get saved. Amen? So the judgment seat of Christ, we'll get more into that in just a bit. The judgment seat of Christ should not be confused with the white throne judgment. Now, look at Revelation chapter 20. As I mentioned, this is God's final roll call 
for the condemned. Look at verse 11. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, again, this is not teaching us that God's going to weigh in the balances the good works that you've done and the bad works that you've done. Okay? The Bible says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not, the Bible says. There's none good but God. Amen? Amen. The Bible tells us that our righteousness are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. So even the best that you can do is still not good enough for God because for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. He says, so why is he judging us according to our works? Basically, to just confirm to you, this is why you're going to the lake of fire for the things that you've done. Okay. Verse 13 says, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their work. So keep in mind, if someone dies today, okay, ushers, can you turn on the AC? It's getting kind of warm in here. If someone dies today, right, they're not saved, they go to hell, according to the Bible. You know, it's appointed for a man once to die, but after this, the judgment, right? And this judgment that it's referring to is the condemnation that a person receives because they don't believe on Christ. If you don't believe on Christ for your salvation and you're trusting in yourself, you're trusting in your works, you're trusting in coming to church or repenting of your sin or being a good person, all these things. You know, if you're trusting on those things, the Bible says that the day that you die, your soul will descend into a place called hell that's, that's located in the center of the earth. Okay? This is fact. Okay? You go to this place called hell and you go there through the vehicle of death, okay? At the white throne judgment, both death and hell, hell and that, the vehicle that takes people there, are relocated to the lake of fire. Basically, a, a bigger hell is what it is, okay? Because you got to think about it, you know, hell is pretty big, and the Bible tells us that hell is enlarging itself. The more people go there, the more it begins to enlarge itself. But at the end of days, when all this is said and done, you have billions and billions and billions Billions of people who are going to go to hell. And therefore, it needs to be relocated to a place called the lake of fire. Okay? It says in verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You say, how can I avoid that? How can I flee from the wrath to come? You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And thou shalt be saved. You don't have to repent of your sins. You don't have to do good works. You don't have to keep coming to church every single Sunday. You don't have to read the Bible cover to cover. You don't have to even serve Christ. All you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Trust in his death, burial, and resurrection. And the Bible tells us that he gives you the gift of eternal life. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Amen. You know, I would hope that if there's someone here who's not saved, that they would receive that gift today. You don't have to become a member of our church. You don't have to sit through hours of preaching to be saved. All you have to do is place your faith on Christ, and that's it. To avoid and to flee from this terrible place called the lake of fire. To flee from hell itself. So these two judgments are not the same. Okay, Jesus is giving us according as our work shall be in order for us to receive a reward. Now, go with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. So what are the rewards? Let's talk about just the judgment seat of Christ, okay? What are the rewards? Well, the rewards can basically be broken up into two categories. Number one being the glory of our resurrected body. And number two is the distribution of authority that we receive when Christ sets up his millennial reign, okay? You know, basically the highest ranking positions in the millennial reign. This is what he distributes at the millennial reign. So what is the millennial reign? Well, the Bible highlights seven years in the end times of events that are going to take place. Half of those seven years, the Bible tell, calls it tribulation or great tribulation. The, at the beginning of sorrows in the last 75 days, great tribulation. The last half is the wrath of God. At the end of those seven years, you have Christ establishing his earthly millennial reign. He comes here to establish his kingdom and he's going to rule the world basically. Okay. 
He's going to rule the world. You say, how is he going to rule the world or with who? With us. We actually get rewarded by reigning over cities all over the world. Okay, this is in the Bible. This is not fiction. This is not Harry Potter. This is not Lord of the Rings, okay? This is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, amen? And look, you say, why would he use that as a reward to distribute authority? Because everyone wants authority, right? We all want to be delegated authority and responsibility, especially from the Creator, okay? And this is the greatest honor that God can bestow upon a person is to say, I'm going to leave you in charge of Compton. <laughs> this is your area to rule and reign over. And he's just like, yes, sir. You know, we are responsible for executing the laws of God in that area. And the Bible even tells us that we shall judge angels. This could potentially mean, because angels are not just referring to angelic beings. This is, angels are also referring to just people who are messengers, evangelists, right? So there can be an order of messengers because the gospel is still going to be preached during the millennial reign. Yeah. People are still going to be getting saved. And we could potentially be judging their work. Okay, This is why it says that we shall judge angels. So the glory of our resurrected body and the distribution of authority in the millennial reign. Now, only one of these takes place at the judgment seat of Christ, which is the distribution of the ranking positions. Both are rewards. One is received at the redemption of our bodies. Okay. So when are these rewards distributed? Well, as I mentioned, the first one is at the rapture. Okay, What is the rapture? It's the gathering together. It's when Christ comes back. It's what's referred to as his second coming. When he comes, the Bible tells us that we will receive our glorified bodies, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, uh, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive will reign. This is referring to our physical bodies. It will be forever transformed. And this glorified body will be upgraded, basically, so that you can be in the presence of God, okay? It will be sinless. It will be perfect. It will be without sin, okay? You say, well, what can I do? Can I fly and stuff like that? I don't know. Hopefully, you know. You go through walls, fly. You can fight. No, I'm just kidding. You know, you can, you can do all kinds of stuff, okay? It's a glorified body that, that never dies, okay? And it's absent of sin, the presence of sin, I can't even imagine that. I know no one we can none, no one can. Because we've lived with sin our whole entire lives and even after salvation we will continue to live with sin <laughs> until we receive that redemption of our body. So it's a it's a body that is no longer tempted by sin. Okay? And it's perfect. This is received at the rapture. So when Christ comes back, if you die prior to that, you you'll be bursting out of the grave. So make sure you wear a nice suit to be buried in your coffin, amen. Go out with style. You know, you'll be bursting out of your coffin, and it'll meet your soul in the air, and at that point is when you receive your glorified body. And if, we're, if I were to try to conjecture what our glorified bodies is, or what they look like, it would basically be like our inward man manifest. It's basically our inward man manifest. You know, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, the Bible says. You know, what keeps us alive eternally when we receive the redemption of our body is the spirit. You know, the flesh profiteth nothing, it is the spirit that quickeneth. My words, they are spirit and they are life, the Bible says. So the life of the flesh right now is the blood. If we drain you of all your blood, you, just, you die, right? Well, when we receive our glorified bodies, we no longer have blood. It's the spirit that keeps us alive eternally, okay? It's that power, okay? And the Bible tells us in 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So this glorified body gives us the capability to actually be able to behold God, to be able to behold Jesus Christ. And I don't want to get too deep into it, but it is interesting to think about this. Like, for example, you know, when Jesus Christ resurrected, he had his glorified body. But notice that there's times in the New Testament that after his resurrection, some people like his own disciples did not recognize him. Right. Like he's on the road to Emmaus and he, he, he saw those two disciples and they didn't recognize him. And it wasn't until later that they realized, oh, this is Christ. What about Mary? Right. When she saw him at the at the tomb and she thought he was like the gardener. And it wasn't until he spoke he, and she said, Rabbi, master, you know, she finally realized that it was him. So it could be that, you know, these people were in the spirit 
And that's how they were able to recognize Christ at the resurrection. Therefore, it's like they were able to behold Christ with their inward man. You understand? So when it says here, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's referring to the fact that our inward man is manifest. That's our glorified body, and that's why we're able to see him as he is. You understand? We can't see him with our physical bodies. You know, a, a human being cannot see God face to face. They can see Christ, but they cannot see God face to face. You know, we're sinful creatures. Now, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So when are these rewards distributed? Number one, at the rapture. Number two, at the beginning of the millennial reign. So look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. I believe this is something that's going to take place at the initial beginning, the start of the millennial reign. Look what it says in verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, the only way you're going to be saved is through Christ, right? That's the foundation. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. The teaching here is this. The foundation is the most important thing, right? So if you don't have Jesus Christ as your foundation, he's not your savior, you can build whatever you want upon that. You're going to burn. You're going to go to hell because at the end of the day, it's the foundation that matters. Now, there's scores of people in this world they have that foundation, which is Jesus Christ. They're saved, but they're not building. They're not living for the Lord. They're not serving Christ. And look, they're going to be saved. They're still going to go to heaven. They just not, they're not going to get anything. Okay? So what are we doing in this life? We're building on that foundation, right? We're laboring. We're soul winning. We're seeking to be a blessing to other people. We're serving in our church. We're doing everything that we can to accumulate these rewards. And that's what it says in verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So picture this. We're in the millennial reign, okay? There's this huge bonfire going on, and everyone's lining up in this holy bonfire, this consuming fire, right, to try your works. And you line up, and, you, and you're like, man, I, didn't even, I never went to church. I, I don't think I ever, I don't even think I want anybody on accident to Christ. Like, I just lived a fleshly, worldly life. I knew I was supposed to be in church. I knew I was supposed to read the Bible. I knew I was supposed to go so, but I never did. So somehow our works are manifest in this realm called the millennial reign, where God is able to manifest our works and the things that we did for Christ. He's able to manifest them, and then they're going to be tried in the fire. They're going to be placed on the fire. If it completely consumes, it basically means that it was worthless. He said, what do I get? He's going to tell you, Hey, you're saved, though. <laughs> Yet so has by fire. So it's almost like one of those, it's, it's not, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay salvation at all. Obviously, salvation is the most important thing, right? But you know what? Anybody who's saved in the millennial reign, they're going to wish they did something after that. You know, there's a song, I'd wish I'd given him more. You know, is I'd wish I had given him more, more, so much more, more than I ever had before. It's basically saying, like, when that day comes, I'm going to regret not living for Christ. Because I'm going to see everyone with their rewards, the distribution of the authority, and then they're going to they're gonna have that everlasting contempt. Where it's just like, man, I wish I could just, why didn't I just go to church when I was supposed to go to church? Why didn't I just go soul winning when I was supposed to go? Why didn't I disciple people when I had an opportunity to? I just wasted my life, Okay. This is the person who is saved yet so as by fire. Verse 16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So, by the way, verse 15 is a perfect verse to teach you that you can't lose your salvation. You know, people who teach that you can lose your salvation and you have to do good works to go to heaven. Well, that's funny because this person did no works, and yet the Bible says they were saved. <laughs> yet so as by fire. Okay? Showing us that you don't have to work in order to go to heaven. The Bible tells us that it's by grace alone, by faith alone. Go to Revelation chapter 11, if you would. Revelation chapter 11. So what we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe, is a manifestation of what we're going to see in the millennial reign. I don't know exactly how it's all going to pan out, how it's going to look. 
But here we saw that we see through a glass darkly what this is going to entail, what it's going to look like. Okay. The Bible says in Revelation 11, verse 16, and the four and 20 elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time is of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So this is referring to now that millennial reign. And at this point, it's payday, amen? Let's look at another passage. Go back to Revelation. You're in Revelation 11. Go back to Revelation chapter 20. This takes place after what's called Armageddon. When Christ comes the third time on a white horse with all his saints, and he's basically coming to just wipe everyone out, okay, with his glory and the sword of his mouth. This is, he's basically coming to reclaim the earth. It's his. He's like, this is mine now. I'm just going to, and if you don't like it, then you're just going to be whacked. This is when he comes to whack everyone who's not on board with him, okay? No ecumenical movement here. You know, people view Jesus Christ as being just this really nice guy. He's wearing a long dress. He has that Pantene Pro V long hair. He's just a really nice guy. And he's just like, he's very tolerant of everybody. Not really. Right. Not really. You need to read Revelation 19 and 20, and it'll show you it depicts Jesus Christ as coming, and he's just going to take the earth by force. Right. He's not asking for permission for anyone. <laughs> He says, hey, you guys mind if we take this little part of the earth here? You guys could, you know, and I'll give you a thousand years to really think about if you want me as your savior. Nope. He's coming, and if you're not on board, you're not with the program, you're getting whacked. <laughs> you're done. Okay? Now, look, there's going to be unsaved people that go into the millennial reign. They're just unsaved. Okay? But you know what? The, pro the promoters and propagators of false religion and false Christ and false doctrine... They're getting wiped out. No tolerance. Zero tolerance. It's the law of Moses being reenacted in the millennial reign. You know, just look up in the Bible in the Old Testament, let, thine, uh, let not thine eye pity. Where God tells his people, you better not pity the false prophets and the wicked people of this world. Your eyes should not pity them. Well, guess what? When he comes, he's not pitying them either. In fact, the Bible's telling us that he's going to rule with a rod of iron. And at the end of Revelation chapter number 2, it tells us that we ourselves also are going to rule with that rod of iron as well. So he expects us to rule as he does, which is strictly enforcing his laws and his rules. You know, I don't agree with that. I mean, sorry. <laughs> what do you want me to say? You know, you cannot believe in gravity if you want, but you know what? If you jump off the ceiling of this roof or of this roof, claiming not to believe in gravity, you're going to suffer the consequences of not believing in gravity. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to fly. I know I can fly. Gravity doesn't exist. Okay, go prove it. <laughs> go jump off the building. And let's see how that works out for you. Okay. Look at Revelation 20, verse 4. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Oh, you shouldn't judge people. Judgment was given unto them. Amen. What does that mean? It means Christ comes to us and says, here's your judgment. This is, the, this is what you're supposed to judge. You are now the mayor of El Monte. You know, the mayor, the, the governor of California, okay? This is the judgment that you receive. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So this reign is, a, the reason it's called a millennial reign is because it lasts for 1,000 years. This is basically to get this out of our system, in a sense. Because we're going to be eating meat, we're going to be judging the nations, ruling with the rod of iron, and we do it for a thousand years. People are living and dying during this time. Whereas we ourselves are everlasting, we cannot die. So when does this take place? Well, the first reward, which is the redemption of our body, we receive at the rapture. We go to heaven for three and a half years. When we come back with Christ, it's when and Christ just wipes everyone out, all his enemies, and establishes his millennial reign. At that point, he begins to distribute authority to every single person. 
according as your works were in this world. Okay? So if you serve Christ, you were faithful, he's going to give you five cities, ten cities. This is what the Bible's teaching us. Now, go to, you're in Revelation 20, go to 22. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Don't go to 22. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So how are these rewards obtained? It's like, how do we get these rewards? And I'm not going to go too much into it because there's a lot that the Bible says about it. But one thing we know for sure is that the Bible teaches us that it is according to our works, right? It says in 1 Corinthians 3, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. You're in 15. I'm in chapter 3. So your labor determines what type of reward you will receive. Now, I don't think we can be super dogmatic about how exactly we get these rewards. Like some people say, well, that's why we only got to do soul winning, only soul winning. No, not necessarily. Soul winning is very much important. You do receive rewards because of soul winning, but it's not the only avenue of rewards wherewith you can receive rewards. And in fact, discipleship, teaching people in the way of righteousness is an avenue of rewards. Because turning people to righteousness is important to God, folks. Not just seeing them saved. Seeing them saved is, is important, but keep in mind the Great Commission is not just the gospel, it's discipling people, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen, the Bible says. So preaching the word of God or even discipling others and teaching them in the way of righteousness, helping them to repent of their sins, to get their life right, to clean up their lives, to live for God, to know doctrine, this actually gives you a great reward because you're teaching people, you're showing them the way of righteousness, okay? So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's talk about the glory of our bodies and how we get it. Look what 1 Corinthians 15 verse 40 says. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. This is not referring to aliens, by the way, okay? <laughs> terrestrial means just basically it's from the earth. So there's celestial bodies, angelic bodies, so to speak, okay? Bodies that are not of this world. And then there's a terrestrial body. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So what is the glory of the terrestrial? Oh, you know, if you're buff, you got yourself a 12-pack, you know. It really is based upon the, the, the era that you're in at that time, right? Whereas the celestial one is not how much muscle you have, but really how much glory you have, the brightness of the glory, okay? You see, you don't think God's concerned with, like, muscles and stuff like that? Well, here's the thing. I think he wants men to be strong, amen, physically speaking. But let me say this, is that he's not muscling his way through anything. <laughs> he's just, he just destroying people with the sword of his mouth. He don't need to lift up a finger. He just opens his mouth and creates things or destroys them. That's power, right? So he's, he's making a distinction here. Look at verse 41. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. So it's telling us, it's trying to give us a picture here that some people will basically shine brighter than others. You see the sun, how it shines brighter than the moon. Some stars shine brighter than others. Well, in like manner, this is how the resurrection is going to be. Some people are just going to shine more brightly. You know, the recognition that you've always wanted, you actually get it at the resurrection. And you know what? Actions will speak louder than words at that point, yeah. right? Because then are like, oh, man, this guy did, must have done a lot of work, you know? <laughs> This guy, must have, he must have done a lot of things that we just didn't know about. He never said anything. He never blew a trumpet. He never blew his horn. He never talked about all his works. Yeah, but you know what? He did them, and that's why he's shining brightly. Okay? So it's the ultimate honor, in a sense, that you can receive when God just gives you a glorified body where your glory is just emanating from you based upon the works that you've done. Go to Romans chapter number 8. Now, how do we get this? Well, number one could be through endurance, enduring affliction and suffering. Okay? It's when you're persecuted and you endure it. You don't wimp out like a little sissy. Yep. At the first sign of someone persecuting you and people getting on you because of what you believe and your family's getting on you or, or you know, the world starts persecuting you and saying all manner of evil against you, you're like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm so scared. <laughs> you little sissy. Endure. Just take it like a man. 
Look at Romans 8, 17. And, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. So when we're saved, we're heirs of God. And then it says, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So to be an heir of God, the requirement there is that we're saved. To be a joint heir with Christ, in other words, to rule and reign with Christ, we need to suffer with him. Well, how did Jesus suffer? He was persecuted. He was called the devil. He was called Beelzebub. He was killed. <laughs> he was crucified. Well, in like manner, if we're willing to endure those sufferings and those persecutions, we will receive a reward. Look at verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So look, all those hardships you go through and the persecution or whatever it may be, it doesn't even compare to the reward you're going to receive when you actually receive your glorified body. Look, folks, this is why it's important that you develop thick skin as a Christian. Well, I just want to get along with everyone. Then you need to become a politician. <laughs> you need to run for office because that's not what a Christian should be. Because if you are pleasing everyone, that means, that means you're not pleasing God. Because what God says and he commands actually goes against the grain of a lot of people in this world. It goes against the grain, and people don't like it. Well, you know, I just try to have a balanced life, Brother Mejia, you know. I just try to be kind to everyone, treat others as I always want to be treated. You're a hypocrite. Obedience to God's word will cause people to not like you, to hate you, to persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you. If that's not being done, then explain to me why the Bible says, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I'm not saying if you live a godly life, you're just going to be martyred tomorrow. <laughs> I, you know, you know, that would actually be good for some people. I'm just being honest. Yeah. What I'm saying is this, is that when you live godly, you will suffer some persecution, whether at the hands of your family members, right? Oh, you go to that hateful church. You guys are a part of a cult. You know, oh, you listen to that one guy on the Internet. Oh, man, you guys are, you need to get right, man. That's weird. And, you know, you're part of a cult and all this stuff, you know, and you just endure that. You just take it. You're like, yeah. <laughs> oh, you're a hate preacher. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're just, you're just, you know, you're just this and that. And you're a Bible believer. Like, yeah. Tell me. Give it to me. You know, you just take it. Because look, if people say these things about you, let it be a confirmation that you're like, man, I'm doing, I'm doing that which is right. Because yeah. yeah. worldly people don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if worldly people like you and they like being around you, that's not a good thing, folks. <laughs> you know, we are not of this world. Yeah. Right? We're Christians. We're Bible believers. We're sons of God. And therefore, you know, if if they're not. If, they're just, if they just think you're just like the best representation of a Christian because you just don't get involved in any controversy, that's probably not a good thing. Because that's probably what they say about Joel Osteen and Rick Warren and all these other hypocrite pastors out there that, you know, just try to please the masses instead of telling you the truth, right? You know, when people revile you, you know, when your friends and neighbors revile you, when the sodomites revile you, just take it. Be like, yeah, it's good. Yeah, what else? Tell me more, you know? This is confirmation that what we're doing is right. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11.35, women received their dead raised to life again and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And look, Paul the Apostle is saying this, and he suffered some really bad persecution. I mean, he was stoned. He was persecuted by his own countrymen. He was in the sea. I mean, the worst happened to him. And yet he said, that was a light affliction. This guy is like a man's man. Right? He went through all those things. He was stoned to death, and he actually came back to life. And yet he said, that was a light affliction. Everybody, 
what in the world? You consider being stoned and beaten and scourged and given stripes and hungering and fastings often and being persecuted by your own brethren and countrymen, by false brethren, being backstabbed and all that? You consider that a light affliction? Well, yeah, well, in comparison to the glory which shall be revealed, it's a light affliction. So look, when you go through, I'm not just saying persecution too. What if you just go through health, you know, sufferings, difficulties and tribulation where you're just going through a tough time, that's suffering too. So if you're going through a tough time, uh, an emotional tough time, or you're going through some health problems that are causing you to, 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 to just be discouraged, that's suffering as well. And God expects you to endure that as well. So, you know, obviously there's persecution and sufferings that, that stem from that, but there's also other sufferings, you know, whether it's a death of a family member that you have to endure, it's financial loss that you have to endure, it's health that you have to endure if you're not doing well uh, as far as your health is concerned. You know, God wants you to endure that as well. He wants you to endure. He wants you to push forward. He wants you to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might and to recognize this is a light affliction in comparison to what I'm going to receive. This is why the Bible tells us that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering being made conformable unto His death. Okay, look at Matthew 5, verse 11 says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. This is Jesus speaking here. And persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. So what is he saying? He's not saying like if people say manner of evil against you and it's true. That's not good for you. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they call me a cheat and a liar and a thief. Yeah, I did some of those things, but, you know, <laughs> I'm being persecuted for righteousness sake. You know, it's like, no, dude, you're guilty. <laughs> You're actually doing those things, and what they're saying, thats the, reviling is when they're saying these things about you falsely, <laughs> okay? Yeah, they say all this about me, and some of it's true, but still, you know, they're a bunch of reprobates anyways. Well, you know what? If they're, telling, if they're saying the truth about you, though, that's not good. You ought to have a life that is above reproach, that is not involved in these things, right? If we're going to get persecuted, it needs to be for things that are not true. Or if it, we're going to get persecuted for being a Christian, for living our lives that's pleasing unto the Lord as Daniel, right? It says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Other passages says, Leap for joy. God wants you to be happy when you get persecuted. You know, when people, you know, slander me on social media or people show up to our church talking all kinds of mess, I, it makes me happy. Oh, this is great. This is awesome. That means our church is doing something. That means we're going somewhere. That means we're pleasing God because weird people don't like the true message. You know, wicked people don't like the message of God. They don't like the contents of the Bible, and they don't like anybody who's actually preaching it either, okay? But blessed are you, the Bible says. Go to Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter number 12. So look, suffering, suffering, persecution, you know, going through tribulation and enduring these things will accumulate rewards for you at the resurrection and even at the millennial reign. How do we know that? Well, the Bible even says, you know, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain salvation which is, uh, through Christ Jesus our Lord. And it tells us if we suffer with him, we shall also what? Reign with him. So you see how a lot of these have overlap. And we don't know exactly how God determines how we get our resurrected bodies or how much of these rewards are, are, are uh allocated to our resurrected bodies, how much of it is allocated to us reigning and ruling and reigning. And the reason why it's not clear, I believe, it's because God just wants just us to do all this, right? If it was already laid out for us, we knew, okay, we got to invest more time in soul winning if that's the most important thing. I'm not going to do a whole lot of discipleship. I'm not going to do it. But you know what? We don't really know which one's the most important as far as what accumulates the most rewards. So for that reason, we have many fishing poles and we put those lines in many ponds because we don't know, right? We sow our seeds everywhere, hoping that at the end, you know, we're going to get all these rewards here. So what's another way? Well, I mentioned this through soul winning and discipleship. Look at uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Or look at verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. This is referring to the resurrection. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. I believe both of these are safe people. The second group are those who basically did not do anything for the Lord. 
Verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. This is why discipleship is important, folks. This is why it's important that you invest in people's lives. We have enough people here that you should find someone that you can disciple, mentor, and teach in the way of righteousness. So you can earn a reward. So you can shine. So you, when you turn people to righteousness and you impart unto them the wisdom that God has given you through his word, you actually earn reward because of that. Yeah. And now again, I'm not downplaying soul winning because soul winning is the first works are the most important works. But it's not the only works. And we need to learn how to disciple others, mentor others, care for others, teach others. Not just in doctrine, by the way, just in Christian living, right? How to be better husbands, how to be better wives, how to raise children, you know, how to be better employees, how to be an outstanding citizen of society, how to be just a good Christian. These things are important to God, you know? He's like, oh, God doesn't care about those things. Well, have you ever heard of the breastplate of righteousness? <laughs> That God expects you to wear every single day, to have a clean heart, to do that, that which is right with our hands. This is important. The Bible tells us in James chapter 5, verse 19, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. God wants us to convert people, save people from living a bad, wicked life to living a righteous life. From living a life that's unholy to living a life that is holy. This is important to the Lord, okay? Now, go to Luke chapter 19. This will be the last scripture we go to here. I quoted this, but I'm going to read, I'm going to read it to you in full. 2 Timothy 2 verse 10 says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, If we be dead with Him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Now, this is not referring to salvation. People want to try to misconstrue this to say, well, if we deny the Lord and we're not going to church, then when we get to heaven's gate, God's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that worked iniquity. Okay? This is not what that's referring to. When he says, if we deny him, in other words, we're not witnessing. Because to be a witness is basically you're testifying of Christ, right? right. So if we deny him, the Bible says he's going to deny us. Deny us what? Rewards. Or the privilege of what we just saw to reign with him. So if we suffer with him, someone who's suffering is someone who's not ashamed, right? The reason they're even suffering is because they're not ashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ. They say they're a Christian, they're an independent fundamental Baptist, they're King James only. Yes, this is what I believe. I'm not ashamed of it. And they suffer for that reason. And God says, I'm going to reward you with reigning, ruling and reigning with me in the millennial reign. However, if you deny him, well, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I don't believe all that crazy stuff, though, you know. You, you just become a, like a wimp of a Christian. The Bible says he will deny you. Deny you what? Rewards. So when you come before, you're like, whoa, what do I get, Lord? And it's just like, you get the mop. <laughs> you get the mop in the alley. You get the broom and the alleyway. That's what you get because you won, like, one person to the Lord. And there's a time when you weren't ashamed of me. But, you know, you spent your entire life not testifying, not witnessing, not being, you know, you're just ashamed. So now what you get, you actually get the corner of the street. You got to make sure the corner stays clean, okay? And that's all you get. Or some, for some people, I just don't, they probably just don't get anything. It's like, well, you don't get anything. You have to, you actually are, have to be under another ruler. <laughs> and you're just going to be told what to do for a thousand years, okay? This is what this is referring to. Look, look, look at Luke chapter 19. Now, a lot of parables in the Bible, you can't take too literally, Right? You can pull principles from them and learn things from them. And you got to know what is the specific doctrine that's being referred to here. But I believe Luke 19 is the closest to being literal as possible. And the only reason I say that is because of the fact that it works in conjunction with everything else that we're learning about the millennial reign. Look what it says in verse 12. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants 
and delivered them 10 pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Now, 10 pounds is not referring to like how much you weigh, okay? He's referring to the resources that God has given you, okay? So he tells them, look, here are the resources. You need to occupy till I come. Take those resources and use them. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, this is the millennial reign, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. The first, uh, then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. This is us during Thanksgiving and Christmas. Amen. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> so in other words, they took that, that pound and they won souls. They took the training that they received at First Works. And what did they do? They, they just won a bunch of people to Christ. Right? They took this, the preaching from First Works Baptist Church and they used it to train others, to develop other soul winners. Right? Thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. It says in verse 17, He said unto them, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authorities over 10 cities. That's cool right there. He's like, because you were faithful and you used what I gave you, here's 10 cities for you to be ruler over. It's like, man, that's legit. Okay. Let's read on. It says, verse 18, And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man, thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath Ten pounds, and they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. Now, the literal interpretation of what we're seeing here is actually referring to the Jews. And the reason we know that is because of the fact that what, what's being stated here is the fact that unto them were committed the oracles of God. They were not good stewards, managers of those oracles. They did not propagate the gospel. They became selfish and kept it to themselves. And this basically works in ten when we see when the kingdom of God is taken from them and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, referring to believers. But there's another application to this, because there's going to be people, Christians, who had that pound, they have a great church, they have Bible knowledge, and what do they do? They put it under a napkin. They put it under a bushel. They don't use it. And then when at the coming of the Lord, he's like, yeah, I'm King James only, Lord. I'm an independent fundamental Baptist. He's just like, but you didn't do anything with it. You know, you didn't use the Bible, you didn't use your knowledge, you didn't use the resources I gave you. Therefore, go ahead and give, give up that pound real quick, and I'm going to give it to that guy right over there, and he's going to own, instead of 10 cities, 11 cities. Okay? I don't want to be that person. <laughs> Where, because I was not a good steward, God takes away the city that I could have reigned over, and say, I'm going to give it to someone else who actually was doing a good job with this city. No, I want, to be the, I want to be the one that at the, at the judgment seat of Christ, you know, I can say, man, I'm thankful that I get these rewards, and it was all worth it serving the Lord because of this moment right here. Okay? So what is the main teaching that we want to get from the judgment seat of Christ? Well, a practical thing is this. Don't faint. Amen? Don't faint. Be consistent. Be faithful in serving the Lord. Don't quit church. Don't quit your Bible reading. Don't quit soul winning. Because you will receive a reward. Sometimes it's immediate, but we know for sure it's, it's going to be in the long run when we are judged at His seat to reign over specific cities. Amen. And what a glorious day that will be. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. A word of prayer. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. And thank You for the judgment seat of Christ. I'm thankful this teaching is in the Bible. Because when we see it, we can imagine, we can think upon and recognize that you know, the things that we're doing now, it may not seem as much, but uh, from the perspective of eternity, it's a lot. And in fact, much of what we're doing here determines our vacation in the millennial reign. You know, that's like a, a thousand year vacation right there where we get to reign over and just rest from our labors uh, on this world. I pray you help us to keep that in mind, that we would labor, we would win souls to Christ, we would disciple people, 
and do everything we can to accumulate as many rewards as we possibly can, that when you come, we're not ashamed. And I pray, God, that you'd help us to keep that in the forefront of our minds. And in Jesus' name we pray. 